who in this classroom has started a business themselves? Oh man, this is great, this is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk about the top things that people look for if you're buying a business. Now, mostly when you go to an accountant, they will want to look at numbers. That's all they want to look at. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Does it stack up? This is how we value a business. Sorry, just keep it passing um, But in actual fact, the success of a business, the numbers do matter but there's several other factors that are critical to getting it right and making a business work. And so if you look at this little list that I've got here, you'll see that the numbers are right at the end. And uh, when we come to that bit, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of time over to my friend Steve here, who is a business broker. He buys and, well, helps people buy and sell businesses. Um, and he'll give you the sort of things that, that he needs to have to help a person sell or buy a business. But the first thing I've got on here is do you fit this business? So let me tell you about a business that I started once. <clears throat> I had a friend and we got sit down talking, he was telling me about this great way of growing food and it was called hydroponics. With hydroponics, instead of planting plants in soil, you put them in gravel and you trickle food into them with water. So in the water you add all these chemicals with all the nutrients and you trickle it in. And it was a great way to grow and you can grow tomatoes in winter for example and make a fortune because every year tomato prices follow a very simple curve. In the summer when everybody grows tomatoes, prices are cheap. In the winter it goes up and goes up and goes up and right from about now uh, sort of Labor Weekend through to Queen's Birthday Weekend, prices are at a peak. And so you can make a lot of money if you can produce tomatoes this time of year. So I got all excited about this and uh, got all the money I could scrape together. We got set up a partnership. We built this dirty great big greenhouse, big tunnel house and planted 1,200 tomato plants and uh, we got a consultant and away we went. And at the end of the first year, we'd lost two crops and made no money. <laughs> Do I fit this business? As my wife is, loves to tell everybody, Lawrence can't even grow radishes. What did he, what was he thinking? Growing tomatoes, 1,200 tomato plants. Well, I'm not one to be defeated easily. And I spent all the time figuring it out. The next year we had a very successful crop. We got it going, it was going great. Prices started to go up. We worked, we worked, we worked, we packed the boxes to get, get them off the market, you know, early in the morning. Prices go up, go up, go up, go up. And that year the New Zealand government signed an agreement with Australia called Closer Economic Relations, CER. And that meant free trade between the two countries. And just as the price of tomatoes hit about 20 bucks a box, which is what we needed to make up for all the work we were doing, the Aussies shipped over plain loads of tomatoes grown outside in Queensland, cheap as, and boom, the price stopped at 20 bucks instead of going up to what it normally did, 40. So instead of making my fortune, I eked out a living, and it was clearly not big enough to make a living out of too big for a hobby, so my mother who had just retired from teaching, I just gave it to her. And she did it, she did made 10 or 12 grand a year, and at the end of three or four years she went on holiday. When she went on holiday I pulled it down because I was the one doing all the spraying and picking it. I was still doing the hard work and getting nothing for it, so, you know, when she came back she said, where's the greenhouse? I said, oh, I needed a new skin, it wasn't worth it, you know. <laughs> needed some more skin than mine going in the job, that was a problem. But, you know, here it was. Did I fit that business? No. no. I was looking at it, it was all rosy coloured glasses, and I just, it was not me. I found out that growing is a lot of hard work, and you have to tick a lot of boxes to get it right. It's a pretty scientific thing, you know? And it wasn't me. So when you're looking at a business, at starting or buying a business, you've 
got to look at yourself first. You know, and you'll see that I put on this list here. What's your previous experience in this area? Or what's your previous experience in managing? If you're going to be in charge of people. Or marketing. Or selling. Now, by definition, a business is always selling something, isn't it? Selling a service or a product. What's your experience in selling? A lot of people can make stuff. Oh, they make beautiful stuff. But it sits on shelves because they can't sell it. Or they don't know how to distribute and get it out to where the customers are. Or they don't know how to get customers to find them. So, you've got to look at yourself first. You've got to put up a series of skills that you need to make a successful business. And if you don't have those skills already, you better figure out how you're going to get them. Um, the other thing, of course, with a business or with a startup is can you afford it? A lot of people, they borrow money to buy a business. Well, when you borrow money, guess what? You've got to pay it back and you've got interest rates. You've got to keep somebody happy, the lender. And, you know, can you really afford it? Is this business going to make enough money to keep you alive and repay the loan? There's some numbers to be done. And we'll get to numbers a little bit later on. But, you know, when you start a business, how much are you going to put in? I have this sort of rule of thumb that says, um, do your numbers, figure it out what it's going to cost, figure out how long it's going to take, then and how much money you're going to make, and then... Multiply the amount that it's going to take by two. Multiply the amount of time it's going to take by two. Halve the amount of profit you're going to make. If there's still a buck at the end, you're onto a winner. <laughs> so, inevitably, costs blow out. Time balloons. Profits, oh, you didn't quite meet the sales targets, you know. So, you know, you've got to be ruthless. When you start a business or when you buy a business, Man, those rosy coloured glasses, this is great. I see tomatoes, I see money. You know, I smell tomatoes, I smell money. I smell tomatoes now, I have bad memories. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. You've got to be realistic. Now, it doesn't mean that business isn't a wonderful thing, because it is, and I'll talk about that as we go. But, you know, to be successful at it is not accidental. Edmund Hillary didn't wake up one day and find himself three steps from the top of Mount Everest and say, oh, three steps, I've conquered Mount Everest. He spent years practicing, years getting fit, all sorts of effort into the right gear and equipment before he got on the top of Mount Everest. And a business is the same. You know, if you start a business and you succeed at first, man, pinch yourself because you're not awake. You know? <laughs> it doesn't happen by accident. You've got to get out there and make things happen. Now, so first thing, do you fit? Do you fit the business? Now, it doesn't mean you have to be an expert at it, but are you ready for what it is that you want to take on? Have you assessed the amount of time and effort and money and all the rest of it? Now, the next thing is this, and this is pretty much the number one thing in any business, the market. You know, it's actually quite easy to make things or deliver a service. If you go to university and qualify as a lawyer, you can be a lawyer. So, yeah, rent a little shop, put up your sign outside, Lawrence Day, lawyer. You've got to go pretty hungry if you've got no customers, right? You've got to get out and find customers. How does a lawyer find a customers? Do you know that until about 10 or 12 years ago, in New Zealand, lawyers weren't allowed to advertise? Lawyers and accountants were not allowed to advertise. Huh, weird, eh? Yeah, thank goodness that changed. But, you know, but imagine, you start your business, it's only going to succeed if you have a customer. So, you've got to understand selling and marketing. And uh, to me, you know, you've all seen sort of a coin, you know, Queen's head on it. There's two sides to it, isn't there? On and marketing and sales. I like that coin. There are two sides of the coin. Marketing is everything that you do 
to get a customer to come and see you, to get a customer to pick up a phone and phone you, to get a customer to know that you are there. That's marketing. Now, when that customer knows that you're there, knows who you are, wants to give you a call, then comes selling. And I'll give you a classic case of how this can or can't work. So my oldest boy started a business with a friend of his and they decided they were going to build cabins that people put on their section to extra bedrooms and stuff like that. And uh, so they built a couple of cabins and they put an ad on Trade Me and uh, they were doing it in my backyard. I've got a big backyard, a bit of a workshop there. So they'd set up in my backyard and so I was out there one day. They'd been going a couple, three weeks and uh, I was talking to a boy's business partner and the phone rings in his pocket, brr, brr, so he pulls it out and goes, Whoa, yeah, 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 that's us, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, about 12 grand, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then, okay, yeah, okay, see ya. Put the phone back in his pocket. And I go, who was that, John? He says, oh, was somebody phoning about a cabin. I said, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, I can tell you two things about that person. Number one, they wanted a cabin. Number two, they ain't going to buy it from you. I said, John, how come you didn't answer? You know, modern building solutions, how can I help you? Well, I didn't know who it was. <laughs> what? You don't have a phone dedicated to your business? No. <laughs> so, get your phone sorted, mate. That's number one thing. Get your phone sorted. Right. Now, did you get his name? Get his phone number? No. <laughs> Did you ask him what he wanted to use the cabin for? Uh, no. Did you engage him in a conversation? Uh, no. <laughs> so, John, <laughs> you can't sell, can you? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> so, I had to sit down with the boys and give them a bit of a lesson on selling. And selling is not a secret, it's a system. You know, people say, Oh, you know, he's a born salesperson. No. Everyone's born naked. I've seen them. I've seen them come out. They're born naked. They ain't born salespeople. <laughs> you know? That's something they acquire in life. Now, yes, sure, people have different personalities, and some people seem to be more outgoing than others, but guess what? Selling is not something you're born with. It's not a personality type. It's a set of skills. It is. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a bit better. Uh, you know, selling is finding a customer's needs, seeing if your product and describe your product and see if it fits his needs, overcoming objections, closing the sale. There's four or five steps you go through. If you go through those steps, you can turn a bozo like me who did a science degree at the university into a salesperson. Man, when I realised I could be a salesperson by just following the steps, it changed my life. So, when you're in business, you have to be able to sell. That's the short answer. But don't be afraid of it. You can go online and Grant Cardone or somebody like that, watch their videos and you can turn yourself into a salesperson. It's just follow the steps. So you have to understand that when you're in business, marketing and sales are killer. Now, when it comes to marketing, you've got to know something about the market for your business. <coughs> Anyone know what sealing wax is? Pardon? Oh. Sealing wax. They used to use it to uh, seal a letter. Yeah, right, right. So if you send put a, someone's seal as a, as a signature. Yeah, so when you send a letter in the old days, you folded it over, you got a dollop of melted wax, you put the melted wax on it, and you stamped it with your signature. And so if anybody opened the letter, you could tell. Now, what's the market for sealing wax these days? <laughs> Not very big, right? It was killed by postage stamps and lick on letters. What's the market for postage stamps and lick on letters these days? Emails blown it away. Times change. So when you're looking at your product or service or the company that you're buying, you've got to know, is this product or service a climbing market or a declining market or maybe a steady market? 
Now take for instance uh, fast foods in New Zealand. Climbing, steady, declining. Climbing. It's climbing, eh? You can tell. I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> it's a growing market, right? In more ways than one. And so if you want to start up uh, a hungies, fast food hungies, is that a good market to get into? A lot of Maori people, right? <laughs> we all like eating, don't we? <laughs> you know? And so, who's your competition? Other hungry places? No. It's every other fast food place, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you've got to take a look at your fast food. Now, if you were going to start a hungry business in Hamilton, where, where do you reckon would be the best place to start? Because <laughs> everybody else is there. But everybody else goes there when they want food. So, you know, that's marketing. You're thinking about, is the market growing? Are there customers? You know, is there opportunity? Where would I locate it? Where are people going to find me? Greenwood Street. Yeah. They're going to find you in Greenwood Street. They're going to find you in the back of Holland Road somewhere. You know? It's going to be in Greenwood Street, where everybody goes. Best place? Right next door to the KFC. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> isn't that true? <laughs> you know, so, so marketing is the number one thing you have to think about. Is the market growing, steady, declining? How can I get customers to find me? Is it about location, setting a hungry food store next to KFC? Is it about being online, like my boy with his cabins? You know? How, are, how is your customer going to find you? When they find you, can you sell to them? Now, at McDonald's, fairly straightforward being a salesperson there behind the counter, but guess what? They still teach them how to sell. What's the old saying about McDonald's? Would you like fries with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you like dessert with that? Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to upgrade it? <laughs> They're selling. You know? Now, I know a guy, uh, Nick Woodahera, own five hairdressing shops on stage because he taught his hairdressers how to sell. So when you went in and got your hair done by Nick, you didn't just leave with a nice hairdo. No, you left with an armful of product. Oh, you've got to have stuff to slick it down, you've got to have stuff to wash it, you've got to have stuff so the colour stays fast. And then you walked out there. Now that product had about a 200% markup on it. He made more money on selling product than he did on paying his girls to do hairdressing. That's why Nick Wooder here had five hairdressing shops, and not one. He could sell, and he taught his staff how to sell. So, marketing. Now, if you look at this little graph that I've got here, you can see I've got a little table on the marketing thing. And if you look at that table, it's got, across the top, existing customers and new customers. Down the side, it's got existing product and new product. So, when you're into a business, what have you got when you start? You're in lot one, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Existing customers, existing product. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to grow your business, where do you think the next quadrant you should go in should be? Two. Two. Why? Pardon? You just said it. Why not three? Mm. New customers. Is it easy to get new customers or to add new product? <coughs> kind of depends what you're in, doesn't it? But, but generally speaking, if you've got a bunch of customers buying burgers off you, it's easier to get them to buy drink off you. Yeah. and food off you because they're already there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's harder to find customers than it is to upsell or add sell. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's quadrant three. New product to existing customers. The most valuable thing you have in a business are customers. And if you have a customer database and regular customers, now you have a business. If you're just hoping that somebody walks by and says, well, I think I need embroidering on my hat. 
<laughs> you're dreaming. You ain't going to find you like that. You ain't going to find customers like that. So, the easiest thing, you've got a little business going, you've got customers, add product to those customers. You know? If you're selling them pencils, sell them erasers, sell them pens, sell them blackboards, I don't know what, but you know. Mm. The next place to grow the business, you've got the business, you've got existing customers, you've got a bunch of product, yeah, maybe you can find some new customers for your existing product. So, Maori's like hungry. If someone wants to, I wonder if Tolan's done anything. I wonder if Pacquiao's like that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, expand what you've got into new customers. Now, the hardest thing to do new product, new customers. Because people don't know what you've got, you don't know where they are, you know. But funnily enough, when you start your own business, you're starting in quadrant four. You've got your product, you've got your service, and now you need customers. So, how do you start in quadrant four? Well, let's keep going through the system so you can understand some other factors about business. Now, what have we got here? Have to finish it. Quarter two. Quarter two. Oh, so we finish it. 250. Yeah, 250. Two right. Okay, yep. Okay, management. That's the next most important thing. If you've never run a business before, and you buy a business with 50 employees, because you won lotto, <laughs> are you going to be able to successfully run that business? Probably not. You know, if you haven't run a business before, you're going to struggle. So what skills do you need? If you're like me, never grown tomatoes before, and suddenly you've got a greenhouse with 1,200 tomato plants, you've got a baby. A fast learning curve, I can tell you, you know. So what skills are required? What can you do yourself? What can you rely on others? So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, about 25 years ago, I started a business selling computer training products. Now, basically there was a company in America that made videos, put the video player alongside the computer, the guy came on screen and says, I'm going to show you how to use WordPerfect. You want to know what WordPerfect is? Yeah. <laughs> You've got to be old to know what WordPerfect is. <laughs> Before there was Microsoft Word, there was WordPerfect that came out of BYU. Some guys there invented it. It was the first world's first word processing program for computers. And it ran on computers that ran on an operating system called DOS. Anyone know what DOS is? Okay. Gotta be old. Disk operating system. Hey, no pictures on screen, just words. No colours, just green words or green screen, grey words. <laughs> Disk operating system. But WordPerfect was fantastic because for the first time you didn't have to have a typist every time they make a mistake, get the twink out, redo it, screw it up, drag it away and start again. You could do it on screen, get it right, and boom, push print. So all of a sudden, about 1996, lawyers and stuff like that started to get computers and word processors. Nobody knew how to use them. So this guy from BYU made a little video of how to use Word perfect. We went on from there to make videos on all sorts of other software. And it was great. I started importing those videos and I telemarketed them in New Zealand. I'd phone up a school and say, You guys are using computers here? Yeah? What software are you using? Oh, there's one saying, Got any training for it? No. Well, we've got this fantastic training on video. All you have to do, plug a video alongside your computer. You can learn. The next kid can learn. The whole class can learn. The teachers can learn. Just buy it once, use it a hundred times. Oh, wow, that sounds good. Tell you what, we'll send it out to you for a week for free. If you like it, buy it. If you don't, your only cost is sending it back to us by courier. Man, one out of two people said, yep, we'll take it. One out of two that took it bought. It was unbelievable. Within less than three years, we're turning over a million bucks. You know, telemarketing. And I thought, this is great stuff. I'm going to set up a training centre using this product. So... 
by then they'd gone from video to CD-ROM and they'd gone to uh, more graphical software and all the rest of it. So I set up a training centre with two screens on each computer. First dual screen computing systems in New Zealand. Training ran on one, application on the other. Went and sat down, put a headphone on and you, this guy could be learning Word, this guy could be learning Excel, this guy could be learning PowerPoint. One tutor, wandering around, anybody stick their hand up, get stuck, they'd go and help me. So my slogan was, any course, join the computer, gym. Any course, any time. We signed up businesses left, right and centre. Within one year, we'd shut out Hamilton's two big computer training companies, Computerland and Ace Training. We shut them out, blew them out of the water within one year. We had ended up signing up government contracts and NZ, NZQA approved and all the rest of it. We ended up with about 15 training centres, got a couple of partners up and down the country. We did really, really well. Now, I've been running that business for three years, and in Hamilton we had a special campus where we did really high-end training, Microsoft certification courses, you know, $1,200 just to sit the exam over the internet. Really good stuff. And we've been going about three years, and I gave my staff a letter to type up one day, and she said, why don't you get a computer on your desk? I've been running a computer company for three years. <laughs> I did not have a computer on my desk because I could not use one. So do you have to be able to do it to make a business work? The fact that I couldn't do it was an advantage. Because if I could have used a computer and set up networks, I'd have been spending all my time fixing stuff up and no time on what matters the most. And what matters the most? Sales. Sales, Sales and marketing. You see, in that company, we built up a great company because the three of us that ended up as partners all came from a sales and marketing background and not from a computing background. We hired the computer whiz kids. We hired the systems engineers, the tutors. We hired the business managers and accountants. But we took charge of marketing and sales. And we grew a business very large business. We're going to 255. Yeah. Okay. I can go after then if you want. No, no, I'll finish a little bit okay. you, so, yeah. so, you know, management. Somebody has to run that business. And it's not critical that that person can actually do the stuff. How many people who manage a car manufacturing company can actually fix cars. None of them. Yeah, there you go. You know? So management, you've got to understand, is different from doing it. Very different. Which leads me to the next thing here, which is leverage. Because in a business, if you want to grow a business, you've got to understand and you've got to look for this thing called leverage. So a lever. Please change your marker. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yep. A lever is a big long beam or rod or shaft, and there's a little thing here called a fulcrum that it levers on. And what it's used for is used for lifting. So, for example, if you've got one meter there and ten meters there, that's a long lever. And you put one ton weight on there, 1,000 kgs. How much force do you have to use there to lift that 1,000 kgs? 100. 1,000 divided by 10, 100 kgs. Whoops. Now that means that a one ton weight, a one ton car, if I get a lever like that, I can put it out, I can get on the end with a little bit of bouncing, I can lift that car. Unreal, eh? That's what a lever does. Now let's talk about a lever or leverage in a business. In a business sense, what it means is when you set up a business, you've got to leverage things. You've either got to leverage money or time.
So let's talk about leveraging money. Say I want to buy a rental house in Hamilton. And it's five hundred thousand dollars. How much money do I have to put down? Twenty percent. So I have to put down hundred thousand. How much will the bank put in? The mortgage. Four hundred, right? And there I go, I buy that house. Now, anyone know the rule of thumb for property in New Zealand and all the good cities? How fast it grows? How long does it take to double the value of a property in Hamilton? Or Auckland? Ten years. Ten years. Since World War II, property values in Hamilton have doubled every ten years. Now that means, if you know that, you can do something very smart. You buy that house. So here it is. It's a little house. You put in 100k. The bank puts in 400. Now, what have you got to do to keep the bank happy? You've got to pay the interest. <laughs> now say you put a tenant in that house. Happy looking chap. Look at the big smile. He's happy to be there. He pays the interest to the bank by way of rent. Now, we go along and we go plus 10 years. How much is the house worth? What's the rule of thumb? 900. A million on that. It's double. It's double. Here's the funny thing. That house that was 500 is now worth 1 million. How much do you owe the bank? Less than four hundred thousand. If you paid any principal. Well, just just let's assume that interest all you've on. paid is the interest. You owe the bank four hundred. Yeah. You put a hundred in, but you've now got five hundred on top. You're, you've just made five hundred thousand dollars profit. So here's the leverage: your one hundred thousand dollars when you use the right leverage, has turned into 600, 500,000. Because you only owe the bank 400. But you've made 500,000 profit on your 100,000. A 500% profit. Now, if you put 100,000 into the bank, how much would you have in 10 years? 110? The interest rate in the bank now is less than 2%. And you pay tax on it. So, putting your money in the bank is a waste of time, except that nobody can steal it out of your bottom drawer. It's only good <laughs> banks are to you. But, if you understand what a bank is about, you can leverage their money, add 10 years of time, use your smarts, and you can make a lot of money. That's leveraging money. Now, Let's talk about leveraging time. There's a chap whose book you've all got to read, and I've put it up there just underneath the heading, Recommended Reading, The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Anybody read the book? Yeah. No. You've all got to read it. It is the absolute Bible for people starting out in business. Not a hard read. He's not a university professor. He's a guy who knows how small businesses work. I went along to listen to him in a seminar, and he said, uh, suppose you're a plumber, you want to start a business, he said, buy a hairdressing shop. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, because when you buy that hairdressing shop and you're a plumber, you're going to be sitting out the back. He said, you're going to see those four girls, maybe guys. Some guys are hairdressers, aren't they? <laughs> uh, wow, I'm on the TV to cut that bit. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, he said, buy a hairdressing shop. Because you're going to be sitting out the back and you're going to be seeing those four hairdressers sitting on their seats, painting their fingernails, reading the Women's Weekly, chatting about the Queen and who she's 
disowning these days or whatever, you know. Mm. <laughs> and you'll be thinking, man, I'm paying their salaries, paying the power, all that product sitting on the shelf and so on. I'm going broke. What can't you do? You can't sack the girls and pick up scissors because you're a plumber. Mm. What can you do? Get them work. Yeah. Right. Promote the You've got to do the marketing and the sales. So, you say to yourself, oh, there's an old folks home down the road. I wonder if I can have a purple rinse Tuesday or something like that to make the ladies. Oh, school down the road. School board Tuesdays. Make a bit more money. You're thinking differently. You're not a plumber or a hairdresser. Now, you're a manager. You're thinking, what have I got to do to make this business work? And so, let's talk about leveraging time. So suppose you are a plumber. How much an hour does a plumber get? <coughs> 35. Oh, no, actually, sorry, it's an assistant, probably 75 odd. No, I mean, a plumber, working for somebody else. Oh. Let's, let's say he's just started oh, out. And we'll call it. <laughs> yeah, what does he get? He's an apprentice, so he's qualified. He's qualified again in 25. 25, very good. That was the number I was looking for. <laughs> so, as a plumber, you get 25 bucks an hour. Now, what's he being charged out at by the boss? 45. 75. 75. 75. At least 75. Yeah. So, what does that mean the boss is getting? So, every hour, every hour your husband works, the boss is getting 50 bucks. So what's the boss? What's the incentive for the boss? Keep him busy, right? Yeah. So the boss says, if I can get fifty bucks an hour just for employing one person, I don't have to work anymore. If he says, if I employ ten people, how much am I getting an hour? Five hundred an hour. If a plumber can employ ten people, he gets five hundred an hour. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. But now, what is that plumber doing? Is he gas fitting and welding and brazing and bending pipes anymore? No, he is keeping 10 people busy. He's got to go out and quote for jobs and win the quotes. He's got to keep 10 vehicles on the road, gassed up, warranted fitness, and full of all the right sort of gear. So when your husband goes out on the job, he doesn't have half inch fittings instead of three quarter inch fittings and doesn't have to traipse all the way back to town. He has got to run a business. Now, when you run a business, it's a whole different job from being a plumber. He's not a plumber anymore. He's a business person. But look at his leverage. The more people he employs, the more money he makes. His hourly rate goes up. Now, does the boss work more than 40 hours a week? No. But his 40 hours is doing different stuff. His 40 hours is managing. His 40 hours now is using systems. He has to have a system that knows when they've run out of half inch right angle fittings, copper. He has to have a database. And when he books them out on a job, well, oh, automatically comes up with a reorder. Because if he doesn't have good systems, he will go broke. So, when you are getting into a business, where's the leverage? Is it in dollars or is it in time? You know, if you've got one person embroidering hats, you'll make so much money. If you've got 10 people embroidering hats, that's good. But now you've got to get out there and find a whole lot of schools that want their kids' hats embroidered. You know, hats actually is pretty good these days because all the schools, the kids have got to wear hats because of the sun. We went on strike to get rid of our hats when I was at school. And front page of the newspaper, all the kids sat out in the field at lunchtime because we wouldn't wear hats anymore. Now they've all come back. Crazy. Should have been selling hats. <laughs> so, you know, where is the leverage? And I put down here a couple of articles, you know. If you've got a restaurant, you make meals and you find customers. But the limitation in your business when you have a restaurant is the number of meals you can make and the number of seats you have. That is a ceiling on your business. It absolutely caps. But suppose you have a company that writes software. I don't know, some game for kids. What's the limitation factor there? 
you spend a year writing the software, and if a million kids want it, and you only got to sell it to them for a couple of bucks each, mm -hmm. and you have been well rewarded for your year's work, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, where's the leverage? What are the limiting factors? Take a look at your business and analyze it like that. Now, uh, just to give you one example on that, and then I'm going to turn the time over to Steve to talk a little bit about what the professionals look for. Um, I've got a mate, Jim. He had a little greenhouse in uh, southern Utah, and well, it's quite a big greenhouse setup, really. He used to grow all the flowers for the city and all the plants for people. When spring came, everybody goes and buys their tomato plants and all the rest of them. He'd have all these little seed boxes, and it was a good business. But Jim decided he wanted to go on a mission, him and his wife. And I said, What are you going to do with your business? He said, Well, I suppose I'll just have to shut it down. I said, Tell me nuts, you know, you've got a great little business here. Why can't you sell the business and rent the sheds out? Well, nobody else knows how to run it but me. I said, Jim, there's your problem. How long before you want to go on a mission? One year. I said, perfect. Over the next year, I want you to keep a daily diary. Everything that you do for the business. Today, I ordered the punnets that I'm going to need in six weeks' time, because I know they always take time to arrive to plant these plants. I ordered the dirt, I ordered these chemicals. What do I do the next day? I got this, I did this. I said, you keep that diary. Because in one year's time, that diary is going to be worth 50 grand to you. What do you mean? So, well, how much money do you make out of this business? I said, oh, about 150000 a year. I said, so do you think somebody will pay you $50,000 for your yeah. diary so that they can make 150? I never thought about that. So he kept the diary. Guess how much he sold his diary for? $80,000. Every year he gets another thirty or forty thousand dollars rent on the greenhouse. So he systematized it. He had to make himself redundant. And the whole purpose of owning a business is to systematize it so that you can go and do a mission, take a week's holiday or a month's holiday, and somebody else is going to work there. They know what to do. You've trained them, you've systematized at McDonald's, they use sixteen year old spotty faced kids make them a shift manager and they can run a McDonald's because it's everywhere on the book exactly what you have to do. Great business. Okay, I'm going to pass the time over to Steve. Steve is a business broker. He's going to talk a little bit about these EBIT type things and the sort of stuff that professionals put together when you sell and buy businesses. Actually, um, I'm going to take a totally different tack oh, okay. on that. Right. Um, not, not altogether, because I can easily cover um, uh, EBITs and how we formulate appraisals and so on and so forth. But um, I think that that's a separate exercise all on itself and can take a, a bit of time in explaining and so forth. Um, and I guess what I've, what I've had in my mind is... Um, the title of the class is the five top things to look out for when buying a business. So what I thought I would do, and look I could easily spend an hour doing this, so I'm going to just do the best I can in 10 minutes or 15. If I go a little bit over and you want to go bang on time, that's cool, I won't be offended. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll do put as much value in as I, I can as possible. So one of the things that I, I work, I've um, I've started businesses, I've run businesses for other people, uh, I've bought businesses as well. I've had quite a bit of it, um, experience. Uh, in the last couple of years I retrained to become a business broker for uh, the Link Company. And when I was thinking about um, today, what I thought I would do is I'd grab this, which is a, a document that we go through um, when we have a, someone who wants to sell a business and we're qualifying them. What is it about your business that's going to make it, you know, worthwhile actually to a prospective buyer, just like you folks? So I thought that that would be a good place to start. And all sorts of things have been popping under my head as Lawrence has been talking. Um, I suppose from a business broker's point of view, the the one valuable thing that um, I could offer prospective buyers. And that is that if 
Lawrence had built up his tomato growing business and it had been, you know, he'd laboured at it and after 15 years it had supported his family and so on and so forth and I get, get to the point where we've got someone who wants to buy it and I say, Lawrence, what do you think your business is worth? Now he knows the answer to that but I'm just pretending. Um, and as he thinks about it, he goes, well, I, I know I've got, you know, I've got uh, $50,000 worth of tomatoes in, in storage and I've got around about another $50,000 worth of tools and glass houses and blah, 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 blah. The only other component that's left is, is the goodwill and that's what the business is earning, Lawrence. Does it pay him $50,000 a year or does it pay him $100,000 a year? Or does it pay him $200,000 a year, depending on how well he's done here? Um, The uh, thing is though, when I say to Lawrence, so what do you reckon your business is worth? And this is typical for a lot of Kiwi businesses um, because they're not trained in business necessarily. They just start something. And Lawrence thinks back and he's, oh, there was the floods of 97 and then there was this and we were trying to nurse the babies and I had to go and borrow some money off a mate and we had to mortgage the house and there's all this emotion, right? So there's the bottom line, it's actually paying you $100,000 a year or $50,000 a year. But when you ask someone what their business is worth, quite often there's a whole lot of emotion that comes into it, right? And they think about all the stuff they went through. I left school and now I'm 40 and blah, blah, blah. And I'm employed. All of these things swirl around in, in the vendor's mind. And that translates. So financially, if I break it down just with numbers, the business might have a multiple of um, 100,000 plus 50,000 um, for stock and 50,000 for plant, that's 200,000. But emotionally, oh, it's a million. <laughs> that's 600,000, you know? Now, if you go along with that, and Lawrence says, well, we went through all these hard times, and, oh, yeah, I can imagine what that's like. Well, you might pay, unappraised, $300,000 for a $200,000 business. Is that a good thing to do when you're starting out? No. Okay, another thing that we can uh, avoid in, 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 a, in a trap, and that is when someone wants to sell a business. Again, it's Lawrence's tomato business, and when he comes to sell it, oh, guess what we hear quite often? Well, I've been running this thing and I've gone stale. I'm sick of tomatoes. I never want to see another one. <laughs> I'm sick of weed killer. I'm sick of I just want out, right? I've had stuff. I just want out, you know? So, as a part of him trying to sell it to me, though, because he still wants to make it attractive, right? He goes, but you know what? You know what? We've been in Horsham Downs for 20 odd years. And, and, and I've got three glass houses now, right? And I only work five days a week. But you, if you added another glass house or two, and you worked an extra day a week, right? That could put another fifty thousand dollars on your income. So it's it's a good it's a good proposition, right? No, it's not. Why is it not a good proposition? Well, so you would have done it. You That's one reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? Well, yeah, why, why, yeah. Oh, well, why, I put it, but I'm just sick of it. I'm over it. I don't want to. Why pay for your future investment? Why pay him for what you're going to do? Yeah, another good point. But there's a, a couple of other key factors. It's a total hypothetical. Mm. It's a total yeah. hypothetical. You could go and take another $50,000, build another two, two um, hothouses, right? And the demand might not be there. Mm. Or... Um, guess what? You're trying to buy the business. Guess who's involved? Usually, 90% of the time it's a bank. Will the bank lend on potential? No. So, um, there's a cut. There's a there's a whole. I could honestly, I could do a three-hour morning on this easily. But a couple of other thoughts that have just popped into my mind as this has been going on that I thought I'd share with you. Um, how does the saviour teach? Stories. Stories! <laughs> Stories! <laughs> Stories is a fantastic. So I own and operate a little business called Natural Health Now, which is online. How did that start? 
in February of 2005, my daughter, my oldest daughter, who was 12 at the time, was diagnosed with a very rare and incurable form of leukemia. It's called Philadelphia chromosome. At the time, all of the hospitals and all of the experts all around the world, right, said that no one who got this particular disease got past two years. No one survived past two years. That was heartbreaking for us, as you can imagine. So I'm in the temple halfway through this. She's in, Zoe's in Starship. I'm in the temple praying. I pick up the, the, the Book of Mormon. It opens at the, the Word of Wisdom. I read it and I get personal revelation. I followed that personal revelation. My daughter is now 27 <clears throat> and uh, on her way to becoming an optometrist with Specsavers and Charwell. Now that's a powerful story, isn't it? Yeah. So, when one of the things that we first start with when we're evaluating a business is its overview, its mission. What does it look like? Does it have a good story? Why is that important to you? Because when you buy the business, what's your story? What's going to get people? There's a, a million and one different health businesses out there. What's their story? What's going to make you stand out? All good so far? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's another point that we touch on, and that is unique features, and it ties in with this overview. Unique features and advantages. What is it that makes Lawrence's tomatoes better than anybody else's? Why would I want to buy, go and buy Lawrence's tomatoes? And if, it, if there is none, have you got one worked out? Why is that relevant to you? Because when you talk, take it over, if you're just one of the 99 tomato growers, there's no real leveraging and profit. Right? You're just going to work hard for 40k a year. And a lot of people spend 200k, 100k buying a 40k job. Um, flip through this as fast as I can. I think Lawrence has already covered uh, with owners, can you do what they do? Um, here's a little gem, right? Here's a little gem. When, <laughs> when you're buying a business, You've got to ask yourself, and in our training as brokers, we have throughout the interview a three or four times. Okay, Lawrence, so you're selling the tomato business because you're sick of it. You don't want to see another tomato as long as you live. I can understand that. You know, you want to spend some more time with the grandkids, right? Um, that's all good. But what else is there? What, what, what? Are, I mean, it's still paying you hundred thousand dollars a year. What other reasons would you have for selling it? And we touch on that and we go over it because there's the reason they're selling it and sometimes there's the real reason they're selling it. Right? And if you don't find what that real reason is that they're selling it, guess what? You pay your money and you inherit it. So yeah, Lawrence was sick of tomatoes, right? I buy the business. Oh, but it's got 100k owing to the tax department. Ah, oh, but there was a little bug that got into the hot house and blah, 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 and in time that's going to, you know, whatever it might be. It's important for you to really get there. And I suppose as brokers, this is our value, this is our patch, that's all we do. And we don't earn anything unless we get an outcome. So we're pretty motivated to do it right. And as it happens, I just like doing it. Okay. Okay. Um, what else can I tell you that's uh, tell you what I can tell you. If you join the LDS BPA, yeah. you want more of this? I'll do it. We have Friday night <laughs> seminars. Yeah. And I'll do one. So have you all signed the piece of paper? No, I don't know where it is. Yeah. Okay, the, uh, there's one more point I'm gonna finish on. There's one more finish point I'm gonna finish on. What you also have to really be careful about, and this is particularly when you're starting a business more so than if you're buying a business. This is a true story. Someone, in, a good friend of mine in Australia, um, came across an invention and it was a little box. And in the box it had a speaker and a recording. And it was a recording of a barking dog, like a guard dog. And he went, wow, what a cool idea with a 200 bucks each. Just imagine all those pensions. 
they can't actually afford a real dog or can't have one, but they can just buy this, plug it in, and as soon as someone comes up to the door and had all these scientists work it out and test it and the police and blah blah blah, as you approach that door, it would pick up that you were coming and it would sound like there was a, a German shepherd about to rip your head off behind that door. They went, wow, what a fantastic, and just imagine them in the fruit shops, you know, they put it out the back, so if they're selling fruit out the front, someone's trying to come in and nick it. Sounds like a great idea, right? Makes sense. Don't assume that everybody, so he became convinced. He bought the agency, he bought 10 containers, or not 10 containers, two containers. Brought it back from Aussie to New Zealand. 20 years later, he still had most of the two containers. <laughs> you know why? Because not everybody felt like it like he did. You know? And we do. We think we've got a fantastic idea. And just because we're, we're really fired up, and we, think, we think everybody else is going to think it's fantastic as well. But it ain't necessarily true. Do your homework. Thanks very much. <laughs> oh, and what I'll do is I'll just leave. I've got some business cards here. I'll leave them. If you want to talk to me separately, that's fine. Okay, thanks very much.